Hey everyone, before we start the video, I'd like to remind you that I am a Logitech partner, which means I have my own discount codes, which you can use across the various Logitech websites. You can use code DATO10 at Logitech and Logitech G's websites at checkout for a discount, and you can use code DATO at Astro's website for a similar discount. All the links are in the description if you want to check that out. Thanks very much. While I fully anticipate Bungie to make some kind of adjustment to the health values of the bosses in Ghosts of the Deep while solo, until that happens, you're stuck with this version. And this version is brutal. It is definitely the toughest solo dungeon experience thus far, and people should be proud to even beat it solo, not even flawlessly, especially this iteration of the dungeon. Today, we're going to talk the loadouts and strategies needed for this place for all three classes. And to make sure that this is as evergreen as possible, no seasonal mods were used in any of my runs. I also try not to do any super intense gear swaps or multiple loadouts, but I do perform one exotic swap on Hunter. I will mention the gear swap strategies in the guide in case you want to give it a go. I'm not really going to be discussing the opening encounter as there isn't really anything special about it. You can use whatever loadouts you want here. You can go as slow as you want. And it's probably not the place that's going to hold you up. The same goes for the exploration section. It's mostly exploration and platforming with a couple of small combat sections. But otherwise, there's not a whole lot to discuss. Do yourself a favor and run this section once or twice to get a feel for it because it is quite long and there are a couple of tricky platforming sections in the water like towards the very end where you need to make two rather precise jumps. For those of you looking to get the solo or the solo flawless and for those of you who play all three classes, my suggestion to the average player would be to pick Solar Titan for this run. Hunters, I would highly suggest Ark, and Warlocks, you are likely to be on Solar as well. Warlocks can run Ark in Season 21 while these Ark mods are around, but with minimal healing available to you, only those very comfortable on Warlock are going to see success. Ark is quite high-powered, but the safety of Solar is probably the main appeal for most. The Solar Titan strategy for Ekthar is pretty simple and something you may be familiar with already. It's a bonk build with Syntheseps and a Tractor Cannon. Your hammer at maximum stacks of Roaring Flames is going to be dealing damage close to equal in strength to that of a Legend of Acreus shot, but with the ease of just mashing the same button over and over again. Not only that, but Sunspots are going to keep you very healthy and even damage the boss a little bit. Arc Hunters, you're going to be breaking out Liar's Handshake or Assassin's Cowl and using the Arc build that I posted about recently with a swap to Star Eater Scales when you enter the damage phase. I ended up using the Lament during this fight and I was able to do it in five phases. Not the fastest by any means, but quite consistent and that's mainly what I'm looking at for with a guide like this. Not only that, but again, I used no Arc Seasonal Mods. If you're in Season 21, this build just gets even more powerful. Warlocks, Solar is probably going to be the go-to for you here using a Sun Bracers build with Legend of Acreus with the Catalyst or the Lament. Just depends on what you're better with or what you have. Sun Bracers allow you to basically AoE everything in the arena, and with the ability to get Restoration on a near permanent basis with Phoenix Dive and some Fragments, combined with the safety of a well, you shouldn't have too much trouble getting through this. Although I will say that I struggled with Warlock the most out of all three classes because their kill potential isn't as direct as the melee of Titan or Hunter. Use this time to take screenshots of the builds that I'm going to be using and showing you right now to make your own. I'm sure the comments will also be flooded with suggestions, so be sure to look there for any extra advice. I was really only willing to test so many Warlock variations, whereas Titan and Hunter are pretty dialed in already. I'm also going to highly recommend a double special weapon setup for each class. This will increase how much heavy ammo you get so that you're never pressured to farm for ammo. This is a problem more for Hunters and Warlocks versus Titans, since Titans' main source of damage is their hammer versus an actual gun. 
the Ekthar encounter moves quite quickly, with the ability to hop from phase to phase within a minute to a minute and a half. Most of the struggle here will be learning to get comfortable being in the middle of a lot of enemies for essentially most of the encounter. If that's not something you're used to, then I would highly suggest just messing around in this room, getting comfortable with survival and the flow of the builds that you're going to be using. I'm also going to assume that you're familiar with this dungeon already. You know the mechanics, you know all those things. If you're not familiar, please go run the dungeon first. Solar Titans, Arc Hunters, you're both going to be playing the same way. Punch everything. Titans will be throwing hammers non-stop and Arc Hunters will be punching and dodging to AoE down all of these enemies. I really wish I could say that there was more to it, but there really isn't. You literally just go around hitting things. Solar Titans will be nearly immortal, and Arc Hunters will burst most of their health back on melee kill. Now, Assassin's Cowl will keep you very, very safe. Liar's Handshake will allow you to burst down the bigger targets even easier. I used Star Eater Scales the whole time. No swaps to show that you don't need Assassin's Cowl Perma Invisibility or Liar's Handshake Burst Damage, but obviously those things are smart to use. Assassin's Cowl probably more so. Kill the Knights, kill the Ogre, and get ready to memorize symbols. Solar Warlocks are going to handle this in a pretty similar manner, but it's not as burst damage focused. Instead, you'll be relying on getting constant procs of Sun Bracers by snap meleeing an enemy to death, do not use Celestial Fire because it's not working properly with Sun Bracers as of this video. It might in the future, but right now it's not. Your ability to slay is linked with the ability to get Sun Bracer procs. So if you're unfamiliar with the gameplay, take a couple of minutes and just slay out in this room to get comfortable because it's very important to master this combo and master this style of combat. The combo is simple. Get a snap kill and then toss grenades, but missing that melee can be brutal as a lot of your power goes away without Sun Bracers active. If you ever need your melee back, get some kills while in the air and you should get it back pretty quickly. You're not going to need that many kills. Your survivability will come from Phoenix Dive. Phoenix Dive gives you restoration times two for three seconds when you have Heat Rises. Do not forget about Heat Rises. But a fragment will extend this duration whenever you get solar kills, which you should be doing all the time. That fragment is called Ember of Empyrean. So the goal is to get grenade kills in that three second window while restoration is active to get it to a longer duration. And from there, it should be easy to keep it active on a near permanent basis. Snap melee for the Sun Bracers proc. Throw grenade to start Sun Bracers, eat grenade for heat rises, throw more grenades, and then Phoenix dive, and hopefully enemies will be dying to your grenades in that three second window. The underwater section plays the exact same, memorize the symbols, get to work. I need to clarify that getting a symbol wrong here is instant death. So whatever mechanism you use to remember the symbols, just practice it, write it down if you have to. This section can be quite quick, when you have some practice and memorize the locations of all the different symbols, I tended to jump into the same spot when going underwater to have a more established route every time, which really helped my memorization. I wouldn't really be trying to go to all the different portals unless you're really, really proficient with your memorization. When emerging from the water, you're going to have even more enemies to deal with, but they should all be handled in the exact same way. Titans should ramp up to... 3x Roaring Flames and bonk everything to death. Arc Hunters should ramp up to 3x Combination Blow and punch everything to death. And Warlocks should be constantly looping Sun Bracers. Titans and Hunters have it nice because they can very easily kill the Lucent Wizards with a couple of punches or a couple of bonks, while Warlocks do need to put in a little more effort. Don't be afraid to use your heavy ammo or some special ammo to take down these wizards. If you're running double special, there should be plenty of heavy ammo on the ground ready to be picked up. So if you got to use an Acrius shot, use it. Who cares? Handling the buffs from the wizards is completely up to you. You can do one at a time. You can pick up all three. Doesn't really matter as you basically get all the time that you want to handle this. The only thing that will rush you to the next phase is if you pick up all three. Because if you don't dunk them all, well, you just die. Nothing stopping you from keeping a wizard alive and farming whatever you got to farm, super, ammo, orbs, whatever. If you need to retreat for whatever reason, it's getting too hot, your health is running low, just dunk yourself in the water. 
The only enemy down there is the boss, but by the time they will run over to you, you should be full health again, assuming that your recovery isn't zero. Titans, when it's damage time, dunk your final vestige and make sure you're at maximum stacks of Roaring Flames. You're gonna run over to the knight that drops the pool, you're gonna boop them the tractor cannon, you're gonna bonk them and they should die in one hit, and then you're gonna pop super while the boss is in there super. If possible, boop the boss before this knight as you run over, it's gonna help your damage. Use your super to tear down the boss's shield. When your super is about to run out, make sure to kill an enemy to refresh Roaring Flames and or to make a new sunspot. Do your best to stand in a sunspot the entire time and then get to work. Remember that to be doing maximum damage, you do need a couple of enemies close by to activate Syntheseps, so just keep that in mind. Not that that should be a huge problem. Keep tabs on your Roaring Flames and don't forget to tag the boss with Tractor over and over again. It lasts a pretty long time, you don't need to spam it, but just keep it in mind. Hunters, when it's close to damage time, if you're not using Star Eaters, swap to them now for Gathering Storm. Getting orbs should not be a huge problem here, just punch a bunch of stuff, you should be good. Then, after getting to maximum stacks, make sure you grab even more orbs to make sure that your armor charge is maxed out. Kill the last wizard, dunk the vestige, and head to damage. Kill the knight, and as soon as you're buffed, throw Gathering Storm right at the boss's head. This should be able to rip off most, if not all, of the boss's shield. Then, just go to town on the boss, hitting maximum damage lament combos. Assuming you have one Lucent Blade mod in your chest, you should be able to do seven normal swipes after a combo attack, and you're gonna do this over and over again until the boss is immune. All of your healing is gonna come from the Lament here. So unless you're literally one HP, the best thing for you to do if you're getting low HP is to keep swinging, just keep swinging. Warlocks can prep very similarly to Hunters in that they should get three orbs of power right as the final dunk is happening to maximize your damage. I would also snap kill an enemy right before you drop in the last vestige for one last Sunbracer's proc. Dunk the final vestige, head to damage. I would drop your well sooner rather than later because while the boss is in their super, their disc throws will absolutely kill you if both of them hit and you don't have any restoration rolling. After the boss wanders over, melee to proc Trench Barrel and get to work. While the boss is in their super, be careful of their attacks as the Shield Slam will push you away. Whenever you see the boss go to attack while in their super, be sure to melee them so you're not getting flung across the room. You should be making sure that Trench Barrel is active all the time and be reloading in between shots. Arc Reloader mods are going to help here a lot. I highly encourage them. Your goal is to get through all of your Acarya shots, preferably with Trench Barrel. Getting crits is cool, but the boss can have some weird movement, so make sure you're at least just hitting the shots somewhere. Reloading in between shots is going to reduce cooldown and will be the difference maker between having a 5 phase or a 6 phase or even a 7 phase. You need to be mashing the reload immediately after shooting and making sure you actually get a bullet in the gun. Here is where I'm going to talk advanced armor swaps. Warlocks have the Felwinter's swap setup which involves swapping to Felwinter's Helm, finishing an orange bar enemy near the boss, and then swapping back to your original set of armor. But I think that that is a bit overwhelming for people not familiar with the swap and also trying to do this dungeon because it's pretty hard. So I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but that is an option if you want to practice. What I will talk about is the Bipod Rocket Swap. Bipod is a new perk that allows you two rockets in the chamber, but they do 40% reduced damage. It's not that great. But Bipod allows you to hold more ammo than usual after a swap. Now, normally when you swap from one weapon to another, you're gonna lose some ammo. But with Bipod, because of however the game ends up tallying this ammo loss, you don't end up losing pretty much any ammo when swapping back to something like Legend of Acrius or Leviathan's Breath. So why is that important? Well, Arblest allows you to remove the shields of both bosses in this dungeon, which is the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of damage. But obviously, you can't use Arblest and another exotic at the same time, so this is where you would do the swap. You Arblest the boss's shield while having a bipod rocket equipped, then you go into your loadouts, you swap to your original set of weapons, so like Legend of Acrius or whatever, and you should have close to or full ammo for your Legend of Acrius or whatever you use. 
all you need to do is set up a couple of loadouts ahead of time so that it's just one button press. Do you need this to beat the dungeon? No. Does it help? Yeah. But it's something I'd want to be pretty confident in to pull off in a run. So if you do want to do that, definitely practice ahead of time. Note that this technique is subject to not work at any moment, depending on if Bungie wants this interaction to be a thing or not. They could patch it out of the game. They could completely leave it alone. Who knows what they're going to do. After a damage phase, re-entering the battlefield can be pretty tough. What I would recommend is going back into the water and then emerge in the middle as the aggro of all the enemies will probably reset and this can give a better entry point. Titans and Hunters probably don't need to worry about this too much, but Warlocks, I recommend it for you. This fight is going to last a little while, depending on how good your damage is. My Titan and Hunter kills were around 15-20 minutes. Warlocks can actually three-phase this fight if you do the Felwinter swap and you have really good damage all three times, but I don't think most people are going to do this. It's probably going to take the average person a bit longer. The nice thing about this fight is that if at any point you feel overwhelmed, you can just take a dip in the water, you heal back up, you take a second, you do some gear swaps, whatever you need to do, and then you come back out of the water and you restart the fight. But it is basically full throttle the entire time. Samuma, on the other hand, is a beast of an encounter. I would mentally prepare to be here for an hour. This fight, start to finish, will take some of you over an hour to complete. I've had people come to me saying it took them an hour and a half. This is a very long fight. Titans, I went to Arbalest and Cataclysmic for my damage phases. You can't really bonk your way out of this boss fight, but you can bonk almost everything else. I also rotated to Lorelei for this because Synthos aren't really relevant here, and I didn't like Path of Burning Steps because the damage buff is really short. Just go for safety. Hunters, I ended up going to Arbalest and a hothead rocket with tracking and explosive light. Tracking is 100% needed here because the boss is very mobile and your rockets will miss if you try to freehand them. Amplified gives a nice reload speed boost, but arc loader mods are also nice or whatever matches the element of the rocket that you are using. If you manage to get an Apex Predator from Last Wish or maybe even Cold Comfort from this dungeon with tracking and bait and switch, those work as well but it's gotta have tracking. If you don't have tracking, you may wanna use Leviathan's Breath with the whole Arbalest bipod weapon swap thing. Leviathan's Breath needs to have the Catalyst too, which I know is a pain in the butt to grind out that Catalyst, but you need it. I also again utilized a Star Eater Scales swap for the damage phase. Warlocks, I ended up doing the same thing as Titan, Arbalest with Cataclysmic. You drop a well, you sit in it, you deal damage. Pretty simple concept there. I personally switch off of Phoenix Dive here as you're going to have considerable downtime compared to the first encounter to the point where the infinite restoration tech, you know, it just doesn't really work as well. I know Arc Warlock has been a very popular choice here with Risk Runner and the seasonal artifact perks. That's fine too, but I think a lot of people enjoy the safety of Well of Radiance. Is there a reason I used Cataclysmic on my Titan and my Warlock and a Rocket on my Hunter? No. Now that I'm actually thinking about it, no. There's no reason. I, I think if you have a tracking Rocket plus Explosive Light or another damage buff on your Rocket, it's probably the better play. There's less reliance on aim, you can move around more, but you can also completely explode yourself. And that's a rather big risk. You know, a Thrall runs up on you, an Acolyte strafes into your view, and boom, it's over. Maybe your linear aim isn't that good, I would go Rockets in that case, but you just gotta be careful. You gotta make sure that there's no ads around you at all if you're using a Rocket. Now, you do have some other interesting weapon choices here as well. Briar's Contempt from Root of Nightmares can roll with Surrounded, and if you can get Surrounded to be active during damage, then this is a really good call, combined with the fact that if you use multiple Root of Nightmares weapons, you will deal more damage to the boss, with all three slots being Root weapons getting you the biggest buff. In Season 21, the Artifact perks can boost this even more. I tried this setup, and I did not like it, because you need to leave enemies alive 
which for some people can be very stressful. Also, the flinch is particularly brutal without some kind of a swap to a chest piece with some sort of unflinching mod, which can also add to the stress. Like, oh, I forgot to switch my chest piece or like whatever. The damage benefit is quite high. It's very, very good. But I think most people would prefer safer, less stressful strategies versus a higher risk strategy. So that's what I'm gonna recommend here. Another thing is the use of Risk Runner. There is a lot of arc damage going on in this fight. You got Boomer Knights, you got the Moths, you got the Boss. That makes Risk Runner not only good offensively, but defensively, since you're gonna get a very potent damage resistant shield. This will likely interfere with any sort of Arbalest type setups though, but if you farm some ammo before a damage phase and simply swap your guns, you can have the benefits of Risk Runner for the majority of the fight. Keep in mind that you can also swap to double special in the middle of the fight if you're running low on heavy ammo, but also don't forget that you probably won't have any ammo in the special weapon if you swap to it from a primary weapon. I would encourage the use of Risk Runner at the start to get familiar with how the fight's gonna play out. Risk Runner also works very, very well with the bipod Leviathan's Breath weapon swap strategy if that happens to still be a thing when you're watching this. Titans though, I'm actually gonna sort of recommend against using Risk Runner. I didn't like it because Risk Runner was so powerful that I would just kill everything with it. This meant that I was not using my hammer to kill things and as a result, I was not making sunspots for healing. I would rather just bonk everything to death and guarantee that I have near constant healing on me versus getting caught out with no heals against a wave of enemies that just end up hitting their shots. If you can keep that in mind, that you should you know, get some healing every once in a while, then Risk Runner is totally fine. For me, I was just like, I just wanna make sure I got healing all the time, no Risk Runner, I'm good. This fight takes such a long time because each step of each mechanic takes like a minute. When you start the fight, the first thing you should do is go around the map and find the three orange bar knights and kill them. They will not respawn until after a damage phase. They hurt really, really badly, and there is no reason to not kill them off. You'll be way, way safer. After that, grab deep sight as you're killing enemies and start the process of killing Vorlog near the respective body parts to start what I've been calling your vision quest. Remember that the vision quest will end at the previous node that you activated on the second and third kills on Vorlog. Also remember that the boss will summon a new wave of moths every time you kill Vorlog, so be ready for that. You're also gonna have adds this entire time, kill them as needed. And finally, remember that one of the three nodes is always gonna be at Oryx's heart, right in the middle of the arena. Once you get your Vorlog kills, the hunt for symbols begins. Now, if you want to deal damage from a certain area of the map, you're going to have to do a bit of extra work because you can't tell what symbol is in what room until you actually go into the rooms. If this is something you care about, then it's going to take even more time to do this phase. Me personally, I just played the cards that I was dealt and I figured it out in the moment. For example, I didn't like dealing damage from the middle, but after you remove the boss's shield, there's nothing keeping you from moving wherever you wanna go for damage. So I would just shoot the shield off and then move. I know a lot of people like to deal damage by Oryx's head because there's a lot of cover. If you wanna do that, then you need to put in some prep by hunting down the symbol locations first. When it comes to fighting the Lucent Brood, some advice. For the Acolyte, just be careful. I was most afraid of this enemy because of their main gun and because of their super. Their super hurts really, really bad, and their main gun can just insta-give you if you do not show respect to this enemy. Just be careful. For the knight, run up to it first to get it to pop its super. It'll spend most of its time just kind of standing idle or just not really doing a whole lot, and then you can kill the adds while you wait out the super. The reason I don't recommend fighting this enemy in their super is because they can hit you with a knockback, which can potentially bring you to one HP or even knock you out of the arena if your positioning is weird enough. For the wizard, it's, it's a wizard. It's pretty standard wizard combat. I was the least afraid of this enemy, but if they get some shots on you, it can get a little scary. Remember that the symbol disappears after your first kill of a Lucent Brood. You must remember your symbol. If you forget, you can go do the other two symbols first 
Just make sure you get the finisher on the other Lucent Brood before the timer on your current Vestige runs out, because then otherwise you're gonna die. As you're coming back from a Lucent Hive with a Vestige, you are gonna be greeted by a lot of enemies. There are two ways of handling this next part. Number one, ignore everything. Go for the Deep Sight, dunk immediately. Number two, kill some stuff first, then get Deep Sight, and then dunk. What you should absolutely not do is get Deep Sight and then kill enemies. Deep Sight only lasts for 20 seconds and the node takes a few seconds to respawn. And with buffs showing only four at a time, you will not be able to see how long you have on your Deep Sight until it's too late. Once you pick up Deep Sight, commit to dropping in your Vestige. The time for killing stuff is over. Your only goal is to deposit the Vestige. Do not get distracted here. Deep Sight, immediately to Vestige. After your first two Vestiges, consider the timings for your armor swaps. Hunters, if you're going to Star Eater Scales, you need Orbs of Power. Other classes, if you're swapping off of Risk Runner, you may need special ammo. There is no rush to get the final Vestige. You can take as much time as you need to farm ammo or orbs or whatever. After dropping in the third Vestige, the damage phase starts immediately. So if you want to clear out enemies, mainly Acolytes, I would do it quickly before dropping in the Vestige or before getting Deep Sight. If you're using Arbalest, remove the shield immediately, like the split second the phase starts. You want that shield off immediately. Titans. Like I said, I was doing Arbalest plus Cataclysmic with Bait and Switch. Not really a revolutionary strategy, but I was focused on limiting my gear swaps to make this guide easier to understand. I was able to do this boss in six cycles. Not the fastest, but not the painstaking eight to 10 that I've heard others doing. I would be killing Acolytes preferably before damage and then letting Thrall come to you so that you can bonk the Thrall for sunspots and orbs of power for your surge mods. Then, you just go to town. You hit your shots as well as you can. Don't be afraid to move if your positioning is causing you problems. Remember, once that shield's off, you don't need to stand in any particular spot at all. You can do whatever you want. Hunters, Arbalest plus Hothead with tracking and explosive light. Again, is there a reason I use Cataclysmic on the Titan, but a rocket on my Hunter? Not really. I could have totally used a rocket on my Titan if I wanted to. Arc Hunter should also clear out Acolytes if possible, but it's tough to get flinched out of a rocket, so it's not as big of a deal. Remember that being Amplified boosts reload speed, so if you can keep enemies around to rebuff yourself with Amplified, that's ideal. You should also be firing your rocket and immediately manually hitting reload to crank out more DPS. Do not let the game automatically reload you. If you have a shoot to loot energy slot weapon, it's a good idea to switch to it before the damage phase so that way you can shoot bricks to get more ammo as you're going to be able to fire more than 10 rockets in a phase. You can also just, you know, walk over bricks. That's fine too. You can hold more rockets by switching to a chest piece with 3x arc reserves or whatever reserves, stepping on ammo until you're full and then switching off of that chest piece. Something I highly, highly recommend. If you're running double special, you should have heavy ammo bricks everywhere. Warlocks, you're playing it similar to Titans, except I would kill as much stuff as possible before a damage phase, since all you're going to have is a snap melee and a grenade to kill stuff, and if you start getting flinched, it's going to be a lot of downtime. Drop your well in the spot where you plan on dealing your damage, not immediately where the buff is. If you're dealing damage where the buff is, they're the same spot, then okay, fine. Be ready to drop a healing rift after your well expires. I also used Arbalest and Cataclysmic here. Again, could I have used a tracking explosive light rocket? Absolutely. Could I have done the bipod ammo tech switching to a weapon like Leviathan's Breath with a catalyst? Absolutely. You have options. Again, I am just trying to limit the amount of swaps you're doing since I imagine most people are not used to doing armor swaps and I'm trying to limit the amount of stress that you experience in this fight. As a damage phase is ending, you're gonna have enemies spawning in. Do not get caught out trying to squeeze in one more shot on the boss. These enemies will absolutely surprise you with their lethality. If you think you're in danger, if you're sensing danger, if you're hearing things, you're probably right and you should bail. Water portals are a great way to retreat out of danger. Just keep in mind that enemies can shoot into the portal towards the entrance and they will be waiting for you if you don't give them enough time to de-aggro feel free to use the other portal you have access to so you can ensure a safe re-entry. From here, it is rinse repeat. This fight's long. 
It is longer than any other fight you have done in this game, most likely anyway. Some of you may be here for over an hour. Play it safe. If you ever have a question and the answer results in you not being safe, don't do it. Make sure you have all your swaps ready if you're gonna do that. Practice your swaps and just practice this fight. Lots of practice. Get very familiar with how this encounter flows because it can be stressful. You can be here 10 minutes without a damage phase to your name. It's tough. Oh yeah, one more thing. Don't forget to finish the boss's ghost. If you don't finish it, they're gonna respawn with a small amount of health, and if you're not ready for it, you're not paying attention, they're gonna get their shield back eventually, and you're gonna need to do another phase. As usual, if you have any advice for your peers, drop it in the comments. I have my own solo flawless of this place. It's linked in the description if you want some kind of a reference. There's a lot of info in the description if you want it as well. Thank you very much for watching, and good luck in there.